Um, hi, everyone. My name is Adam Roth, and I am, have been a Chinese teacher for 20-some-odd years or so. Um, I've mostly taught Chinese um, language and literature at the high school and at the college level. I actually lived in Seattle, Washington uh, for many years, taught at Lakeside School for 12 years, and taught at the University of Washington as a lecturer before that. But I also have some, some experience, not a lot, uh, working with school students and elementary school students. And about 18 months ago, I left Seattle to come here to San Francisco to work at the Chinese American International School, or we call it CASE for short. Um, and I'm not working in the classroom. I'm actually working to develop uh, digital content, what we're calling digital Chinese initiatives. And in addition to uh, offering, uh, or creating blended learning environments to supplement our, our, our uh, teachers do in the classroom or offering uh, flipped classroom content, I've, I'm also launching an online class for our graduates. And I'll give you a little bit of background of, about what, what CASE is and why we're doing this sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm getting over a cold, so I might be coughing from time to time, so bear with me. Um, so, first of all, why an online class? So, a little bit of background about CASE. CASE is a pre-K through eighth grade dual immersion Chinese-English school. Um, and this is a picture of our elementary school students at last year's uh, Chinese uh, New Year festivities. And when our students graduate in eighth grade, they've been studying ch Chinese for nine, even more years than that. And they generally leave with a minimum of an intermediate mid, and some at pre advanced And even last year, there were a couple students who uh, tested OPIs and re reached uh, advanced mid levels. So th they can do quite a lot with the language. And one problem that they face when they graduate, here's our graduating class in 2015 last year, is they'll matriculate to high schools around San Francisco or the Bay Area at large and find that there really aren't adequate Chinese courses that can, that can challenge them. They will go into AP Chinese classes and then take the AP uh, exam at the end of the year, and then they, they typically have maxed out in their high school's program. And th this is a, a real problem because our students have spent so much time learning Chinese, and then by the time they're sophomores and then they're stuck, and there's, there's nothing more to do. So um, one initiative that CASE wanted to do is offer a fully online class so that they can continue working at the advanced level regardless of where, where they are. And so we've just launched this pilot version this past year. And as, it, as it's happened, we have uh, one regular year track where some of the students are actually taking it for credit. Their, their, teach, their schools have allowed them to count this as their foreign language credit. Other schools have said, no, we want our kids to take our own foreign language courses. So they're taking this in addition to um, their Spanish or Italian classes that they're, they're taking currently. Um, so in, in a way, th this is something that's in a, keeping their, their language skills going, trying to push them to to work more at the advanced level, but we also have to be um, aware that a lot of these students are ninth graders. They're learning how to do high school, let alone learning how to be in an online class. And finally, and most importantly, they've been studying Chinese as a subject for so long that we wanted to make this online env environment more interactive and more interesting and more real world, in a sense, trying to, to use 21st century skills in, in engaging them. So. The approach that we decided to take was simply not to focus on let's learn lots of characters and let's learn a lot of vocabulary and here's more grammar that they've done, you know, quite a long time now. Um, sure, we do a little of that, but instead to, to try to focus more on a project-based approach. Now, unlike um, um, actually, I'll add here, I also attended last summer's um, PBLL uh, workshop at the NFLRC um, with Cole and others, and I'm very much a novice at this. I feel like that my skills as a foreign language educator are more in task-based learning, but when it comes to big projects, I uh, tend to be a little bit more traditional in approach. So when I talk about how we develop things, I'm going to uh, show you um, why we decided to use PBLNL, but to do it gradually over time. So why PBLL, uh, why, why, why project-based language learning, okay? So first, our students have already had a lot of experience in Asia. They go to Taiwan in fifth grade, uh, Beijing for foreign language study in seventh grade, and they do a more experiential trip, often uh, 
involving uh, uh, being in rural areas in China in the eighth grade. And they're often put in homestays, and here's an example of a fifth grader in his Taiwan home day. Um, or they're, they're in homestays in, in Beijing and have a lot of time to explore uh, sites and, and, uh, and um, uh, you know, fun, fun places to go in the city. And then also to use your Chinese in burgeoning service learning opportunities in terms of what they can do as eighth graders. Um, but at the same time, the students need to, to move forward to, to say, we want to look at Chinese as more than simply a class that we've done, but something that we can really say that we want to become lifelong learners with this, especially given that they're doing this in addition to other work. We wanted to make it fun and motivating and exciting rather than just simply, oh, here's another class for them. And so this seems to be a good entry point for them. Now, I, I will say that because this is the first time that we've run an online class, and this is also for all of the students the first time they've taken an online uh, class as well, that we've decided to, to, to go step by step into, into full PBLNL or gold standard PBLL, uh, PBLL as the uh, Buck Institute might call it. And so the, the very first projects we did were shorter, a little bit more traditional in nature, but trying to, to ensure that they are, they're able to navigate around the, um, um, the, 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 the LMS that we're using, and I'll show that to you in a second, and to be able to use a variety of online tools and to use these effectively. So these are all these are all online tools. Some of you may know. Um, some of them I learned about when I was at the uh, PBLNL Institutes over the summer. So the first thing that we use is, is, uh, is Google Hangouts on Air. And if you're aware about this, this is a fantastically uh, useful uh, um, uh, browser app. And it also can be used on iPhones and iPads as well to do live conversations similar to Skype. But one nice thing about this is that it's called the on air function, which allows participants or even in terms of classes that we do to be simultaneously recorded. And I'll show you some examples of this in a moment. But this will give um, opportunities for students to do projects where they can actually record what they're doing in the Google Hangouts. Um, some other tools, uh, Nicole also mentioned Zaption, and I'll show you a, a snippet of, an, of a Zaption video that we've used. Um, Google Forms and Google Docs, I, I probably need no introduction, but I'll show you how we've used those as well. Um, Screencast-O-Matic is something that we've used in addition to, uh, to other, other tools to create uh, videos, and the students have used these too. Um, Vokaroo is a very quick and easy tool to record audio very, very quickly that students immediately can record something and send a link to us as teachers or, or save it as an uh, MP3 if they want to use it for other things. Um, many of you are probably aware of VoiceThread is another way to engage with students. And then like Padlet is, is a nice tool to engage students in terms of brainstorming, uh, both in terms of in class and then off air as well. Um, and then finally, we also use an LMS. And uh, if you don't know what LMS stands for, this is for uh, learning management system. So some examples are Haiku. And here's the example of our Haiku page for our online class. And others are Canvas, Moodle, Schoology. And there's even some other, other ones like Edmodo that are really useful for younger students that we use even our, uh, in our elementary school here at Case. Um, so I'll be showing you some exa uh, to many examples of how I've outlined things in our Haiku LMS. And um, even though that I'm presenting to you an online class, everything that I'm showing to you is something that I feel that any language educator can use to create blended learning uh, modules to support PBLL, um, project-based language learning, or any sort of activity that you want to do. Um, in addition being able to post videos like we, we've done here in that, in, in that one box in the middle. Um, we can create flip classroom videos, and students as well can, can, can post their own videos. And then, of course, there's, there's links to all sorts of other resources as well. And ultimately, we like using an LMS because students can share work, comment on each other's work, do peer editing, all, all of those sorts of things. Actually, you can do that without using an LMS by using Google um, Docs and such. But this is an extra uh, layer that, that students can, can, can consider this is their classroom environment outside of the, the regular classroom. And of course, we don't have one. So um, I'm going to be switching uh, in and out of my PowerPoint to show you very 
first thing. So I'm going to switch over to show you what Google Hangouts on Air looks like. And let me expand this. Um, this is an example of a class, and I hesitate to try to play the audio and have it play over on my uh, on, uh, play over on my internal mic. I don't want to have any echo, but I'll just quickly start playing it. Um, oops, I picked the wrong one. Well, let me just switch windows. I'll show you that one in a second. This is the first one I wanted to show you. Um, this is an example of an online class session with Josie Guo. You may have seen her picture a second ago with three um, students um, in, the, in the Bay Area. And we always try to have very small classroom environments. It's very hard to do an online session with more than four students. It gets a little unwieldy unless students are doing some sort of presentation. So I play this. So I'm listening right now. And right, no right now, Josie Guo is introducing her, her screen and asking students to, to do a little Debate, whether they think a, a character is a hero or he's a um, he's a coward, and so various students have, have have come up with answers and they're giving their answers, and then I can go forward and another student will be giving her answer, and then I can go forward a little bit, and then Josie at the end finishes the segment, goes back to her own to her own uh, uh, face view. And then shares an activity that they to close the class where they have to do some sort of, um, of voting. That they want to see how many people in the class thought that this character was a uh, was a coward, how many thought that he was a um, uh, a, a hero, and then this little class snippet ends there. So this is how we have asked, and then using Google Hangouts on Air, this entire snippet was was recorded and live onto, onto YouTube, which we're able to download and save and use for other things. And I'll show you um, how students have done that in, in one moment. Um, let me jump back to show you what our haiku looks like. So I'm going to go over to my browser and over here. So um, we, we have a couple of different classes, and this is the uh, the version of the welcome page that we have for students, just simply to get them into the online environment. And we have videos for them where we introduce ourselves. We have students do some inter interviews. Uh, we have an assistant teacher who works at the Bay School where these, these students are, are in class to make sure that they're on target. And in the very beginning, we, we use tools to try to get them to, to understand how they're going to com communicate with us online as much as possible. So we, at the very beginning, we use a Padlet bulletin board for them to think about what are some of the strategies that they'll need to do to be able to, uh, to be successful in a class like this. And they, they use this tool to share things. And we use Padlet quite often often to, uh, to brainstorm ideas and such. So I wanted to show that, that quick tool for you. Um, moving back, I'm going to share one example of a project. And um, give me one second. I need to click into this window. Uh, our very first unit was more traditional. And so this unit was, was where I, several years ago, and a colleague of mine from Lakeside School, her name is Vicki Yang, uh, we, we rewrote the first three chapters of The Monkey King, or also known as The Journey to the West. And um, I'll show you what these look like in a second. The students read through the, the, the first three chapters. They have traditional vocabulary activities. And then on the page, we have all sorts of, of uh, guidance for students, what they should need to be doing. And then we do have a project at the end, but it's a very traditional project in the sense where we're asking them to use their own imagination and, and write their own story in Chinese that would, that would be a chapter four. What might happen next after, after this story? So let me sh switch again out, out of here and show you what this looks like a little bit. So if I go into Microsoft Word, let me switch my windows. This is what the story looks like, and you've rewritten this. Story. We've, we've put in uh, um, uh, uh, pinyin, which is the romanization to identify uh, uh, characters. We put it right into the text so that the students will be able to read this uh, very fluently, giving a separate page for, uh, oops, wrong one, for vocabulary. Oh, I didn't open. I'm sorry. Well, I have a separate page for vocabulary. And this is, and then we have uh, vocab quizzes and, and exercises to go over all of this. 
this is very traditional, and I, and I think perhaps teachers will recognize that simply, okay, we're introducing vocabulary, we're engaging them this way, and we're getting to a final project. But we wanted to make sure that, that, that the students are able to make sure that they're going through everything they need to be doing online, and then also learning to be able to share their stories. And then here's an example of one of the stories that a student wrote, um, where they've written, again, a fairly lengthy story. This is, this is probably advanced level work, given that they're writing in clear paragraphs that are connected and, and, and such, and the story has a beginning, middle, and end, and it's more than, than what an intermediate level student might do. So they're fulfilling the task, but again, it's, it's, it's just very traditional that way. Students will, our, their final um, uh, activity was to go back and read through each other's stories, offer co comments on the haiku about it, and then we moved on to the, the next unit. So to, to evaluate this a little bit, I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoints and say this is just a regular project unit. But it, but it served our purposes to, to get our course up, up and going. Here are some things it does reasonably well. It engages students in reading and writing in standards-based and culturally appropriate uh, topics, has vocabulary practice. It's on target for uh, getting them to engage in the language. There's some amount of student voice and choice to develop their, their written chapter that's engaging their creativity. And they're creating a, a document that's not simply just for the teacher to, to read through and give a grade and, and uh, uh, check for mistyped characters or, or, or grammar problems and so on, but for students to actually read and evaluate as well. But for, for things that this unit does less well, and that no one is going in, is there's no real challenging problem or question. There's no real world tasks here. This lack of, of a sustained inquiry that, okay, this is kind of fun, but okay, it's just a monkey king, and what does it really have to do with us? What does it have to do with us as 21st century learners? So to that end, we've been moving forward to try to engage more real world projects. Our second unit had to do with the Gaokao, or the Chinese National Entrance Exam for college, and then we had students uh, do an online skit together. Still, it's, uh, it's still more traditional in, in terms of the, the final project, but in, for this part, we're actually having students work together collaboratively using Google Hangouts on Air, and they're, they're learning about a real-world topic and talking about the comparisons to, um, to entrance exams that they have faced either to get into high school or will face, like SATs and so on, to get into college. But the but the the the, the third unit it was essentially the what is the the real meat of the PBLL the project based language learning and this is what I developed um, last summer at the NFLRC Institute. What I did have is a a traditional project that I did with my high school students in Seattle and here it is I lay it out there's a big long list of things that they need to do and you know say use a flip camera and go find someone to interview and we did some interview questions and so on and then they came up with with a project it wasn't really contextualized very well to 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 just to, to sustain that level of, of inquiry or even to, to answer, oh, why am I doing this? So what? Why do I need to learn about immigrants? So to, to, to be able to give a, a greater framework for project-based language learning, here I'm going to share the project square. And for those of you who were, who were in, in Tuesday's session, Lauren Scheller shared an example of what the project square looked like. And so here's what I wanted to take my traditional project and make it into a true project-based language learning um, uh, uh, project. And so we're, we're looking to see what would be a driving question. What would be an entry point? And so our students, um, I'll, mention, I'll go over here to the purpose, have already learned about Chinese immigration to California, both in the lower and the middle, uh, middle school. And they have some um, experience interviewing Chinese people on the street when they went to Taiwan and Beijing. So we're now asking them to consider, well, how do we document the story of Chinese Americans? And, and is there a common, a common theme or are there any different stories that may, uh, may be able to shape into corpus stories about Chinese Americans? And so the idea for this was to, to show them that, well, look, NPR, you may have heard the radio show, This American Life. Well, why don't we try to create a This Chinese American Life where we're all interviewing different Chinese people and then 
pitching their stories. The students have to do an interview and then do a almost journalist sort of report to say, here's this person's story to, to make a video project. And then with the idea is that they will, will do a voiceover so that they can showcase their own oral production and not just simply their interviewee's um, ability to answer questions. And where's the audience? Well, we, we're going to put the Google Plus communities, um, put this on a Twitter feed, share this with students back here at Case who are already learning about um, immigration in lower and middle school and should be able to understand what's happening in these videos. And then down the line, um, when we have a, a greater corpus of these, I'm considering why not put this all online and share this with other Chinese teachers and students across the country to say, here, learn about, learn about more, learn more about um, immigration in California from these stories that our students have produced. So um, to show how this has worked a little bit, um, let me, I'll go back to that in a second. Um, I'm going to go back to my QuickTime and switch windows. And so here's a couple of examples that students have been working on right now. They're right in the middle of working on this project. And this student just completed hers, although she had a little bit more work to do. I'm just going to play it, even though you can't hear. She's actually, I'm mean, going to stop for a second. She's a, currently a junior. She was a case graduate from a few years ago. She's a junior at a, um, a boarding school in Connecticut. So she's logging in three hours ahead for our online class. And then because in her area of rural Connecticut there weren't many Chinese immigrants, we found her a friend of Josie Guo who was in Philadelphia. So she's currently talking to her interview subject while she's in Connecticut. Um, her interviewee is in Philadelphia. And as they talk, it, it switches back and forth depending on, on who's speaking. So she has documented her whole interview um, about, you know, what the, she wants to learn about this person. And then she's going to edit this into another video. I'm going to switch one more time to another example. This is a student who actually uh, is a ninth grade student, just graduated last year. He's actually not on the, the video. He's interviewing a local San Francisco resident because many Cisco residents are Cantonese speakers, um, this is a, a friend of his, uh, 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 the grandmother of a friend of his. He invited his friend to help translate, and so she speaks a little in Mandarin, but she's speaking mostly in Cantonese. And his his uh, his friend, her um, her daughter, her excuse me, her granddaughter is translating. So this is interesting. Her, it's actually it's kind of funny because her, her his friend just thinks this is hilarious. And oh my goodness, I'm translating for grandma here, and this is just hilarious that I'm doing this. But but it's fun all the same because this is real life. We can't really predict what's going to happen. But he does hear a lot about th this this woman's experiences coming to the United States. Um, I think about 30, 40 years ago. Um, so this is real. This is something that they can learn about themselves. They can text with their friends about this, and perhaps there's going to be more conversations for this later on. Um, I'm going to switch one more time to show you how we scaffolded this. I'm going to go over to my Google Doc and to prepare the students because talking to someone online is not necessarily a very easy thing to do, and uh, let alone a stranger. We asked students to consider what questions are they going to ask. And so they all came up with their list of questions, and then we put them in this Google Doc to share with each other to say, well, read other people's questions. You may have other ideas. And then for some questions, we asked them to think about, well, this particular question, um, which we actually saw this one student say, what age were you when you came to America? And this is a get one word answer. Oh, I was 20. What are some follow-up questions you might ask? This is something that the students may not have considered how to be able to do this, particularly in a foreign language. What are some things you can think to do right now? And then perhaps they might be a little bit uh, uh, more prepared to think off the cuff in a true interpersonal way when they're engaging in their, in their interview and producing it for this. So I'm going to switch over to the Haiku page and show you how we've also scaffolded this, because this is the, the final project, but we have a whole series of activities to engage students um, with, the, with this, this topic. And first to learn about, well, what are some of the difficulties that, that people have? So this is a very quick news report where it's asking that uh, Chinese people on the street, that as of two years ago, there are, are stricter um, uh, regulations for applying to be a uh, to be a, a a a resident here in the United States, and so they've just gone on the, uh, on the street and asked some people. So, 
what do you think? This is hard. Well, that was a quick one. That, that, that little kid he did in Chinese, which is just the, I don't think it's all that hard to come to the U.S. And so they, they did. So we asked students to watch this video first. It's only about a minute long. But then we also create a Zaption video. And this is the, the, the resource that, that I, Nicole mentioned. And I'll show you what we've done here. We've, we've reposted the video. And then when there's suddenly words that may not be uh, familiar to the students as the, um, uh, as the host is talking, we've put them right in there. The students can stop and read this as they need it or just see it really quickly and go on. And show you what happens. Oh, we have a question for them. Okay, so at this point we say, please tell us what are some of the things um, uh, that, or just tell us what is this uh, news report about? And they had to type in a response that, that we will see later. Okay, I'm gonna submit and go on. And then we'll have another question. So this young man who says, I don't think it's all that hard to come to the United States. So that was a question. So. Please say, please type out what he said. This was a very easy to understand phrase for them. And so we're engaging the students to actually respond to questions with this. So regardless of if you're doing project-based learning or not, this is a wonderful tool to, to use um, YouTube videos to create really interactive um, uh, sorts of things. Um, moving on, we have other news reports that are a little bit more hard, and we have a Google form for them to, uh, to ask questions. And then in addition, um, we watched the first few episodes of a Chinese serial drama called Farewell Vancouver. Uh, I use this all the time when, when I was teaching in Seattle, because of the connections between Vancouver and Seattle, two uh, Northwest cities in, the, in North America. And it's a, it's a terrific drama because all of the actors are, well, um, are from Beijing. They speak very clear Chinese. I think of subtitles that the students can't understand what they're saying. They can go and read things. And it has a fun story to it. And it's about a, a group of Beijing immigrants to Western Canada and some of the, the, the trials and tribulations that, that they find, along with some soap opera elements that make it fun to watch. So in addition to watching these videos, we have the students actually fill out Google Forms where we have to ask them questions like, what do you think happened here? What was this person's response? And if you were this character, what would you have done in this situation that will guide our, um, our um, discussions when we have class? And, oops, sorry, I hit the wrong button. I'll try to switch a window to a new browser. Um, show you these are what the responses look like. If you use a Google form, these are exactly the questions that we ask and here are the students' responses so that they're well prepared in advance to engage in class discussion um, when, when, they're, when they're going on. So all of these activities are getting the students to think about what is the experience like for a Chinese immigrant to come to North America, to come to Canada or the U.S. And there's even another activity where they have to read uh, a reflection of a Chinese woman who immigrated to Sydney, Australia. So we're looking at this from a global perspective, um, in addition to simply a local perspective here in San Francisco. So all these things are leading up to, to, to build the student's inquiry beyond just simply what I did in, in the very traditional way, saying, here's our project, we'll interview someone. Here, the, the hope is that they're really engaging with these ideas and have, have a bit more context to the interviews that, that they do. Um, I'm going to switch back one more time to here and talk about um, the evaluation of this. And I, I can't quite say this is a gold standard PBLL unit yet because it's the first time doing it and there's probably some people over the NFLRC thinking, oh my God, Adam, what are you doing? But I'm trying to do something that's approaching gold standard or um, high quality PBLL. So what I think some of the things that, that does well is that there's a point of inquiry to drive the project, that the learning about the experience of Chinese immigrants. There's, a, there's student choice in the person to interview, and they can decide how they want to, to structure their, their projects. We have inquiries in a number of different media, videos, news reports, uh, TV shows, readings, um, and, and it's engaging students in, the, in all four skills, both in and out of class. And then we're eventually creating a project that's going to be public, first to case students and then down the line maybe a website that can be seen nationally that will take some time to develop. 
But while we're doing, what we're thinking about this is that perhaps less well is focusing on traditional grammar vocabulary practice. It's just, at some extent, we can do a little of this, but I've chosen not to in this one, um, in this particular unit. And this is where we have to have to think: Do we really need to do this? It's, this is uh, uh, trying to engage students in ways that are. are really meaningful in, in ways that they're they're able to produce something, they're able to connect with real people, and ultimately, I think this is more valuable in the long run. So with that, I think I'm, I'm getting close on time in terms of leaving time for questions. I'll stop here. I want to thank you for listening. Um, again, here's my contact info if you want to be in touch or send me a note on Twitter or follow my feed, and thanks so much for listening. Thank you for presenting, Adam. Uh, let me note once again that a poll has popped up uh, asking our participants to uh, evaluate this session. Uh, and if you're not <coughs> seeing the poll pop up, then please, again, use that green stripe and the options pull down to access the poll. Adam, uh, I think there's a fair amount of interest in this project that you have presented because uh, several people are asking, now how do I get on that website? Um, teachers want to get on the CASE website and, and look at the class, but I imagine that that's uh, restricted to the teacher and the students. Am I right? That is correct. That is, um, the high school uh, LMS, the learning management site, is, uh, is for the students and for the instructors only. However, for people who are interested happy to share resources that we develop, like a link to the Zaption video, um, to, to, so you can see how you do it. However, when I say this, the Zaption video created, if you're trying to answer questions, it'll come back to me. You'll have to develop your own so that you can create your own Zaption account, for example. Or um, to, to show you my rubrics, which I didn't share like um, the people did, I can show you some of, of, of those sorts of things to show you how we've developed this. I wanted to focus more on, on kind of the, the, the progression from moving traditional more toward high quality PPLL. Right. Uh, in, in connection with that, um, I, I think people are wondering what the benchmarks are along the way. I mean, how, for example, um, the, the final project is you're, you're imagining as a This Chinese American Life podcast. Now, in order to create that, the students need all that experience that they have gotten along the way, watching the television show to understand the background of immigration, and then gathering their, well, first of all, deciding on their interview questions, and then actually gathering that data from their interviewees, and then doing the post-production. So there are all these little bits and pieces. People are asking, what kind of benchmarks do you establish during the the project to sort of evaluate them along the way, Are, can you describe some of those? So what we've done is we've given them stages to to create things. So uh, for example, um, I'm going to switch back. Give me one moment. Switch back to my haiku page. Uh, wrong one. Sorry. Give me one moment. And if I go in here, that for every week we have a, a checklist of things that they need to do. Um, so this is a checklist that we had for right before the holidays, saying that over the holidays, you need to start trying to identify a possible subject and then figure out when you can uh, to interview with them. And if you need help, um, while I'll share, that's me, Teacher Wang can help find uh, interview subjects. So actually, one student uh, wasn't able to find anyone, so I contacted a local organization, the, um, the Chinese Newcomers Information Center, it's called. And it's a, it's a service center for recent immigrants to find jobs and learn how to apply for jobs and find housing, these sorts of things, and found someone that he was able to interview for this. Um, we, we don't grade these, these parts. We just want to make sure that they're following these sorts of things. And one of the pitfalls that we've found, particularly with the students who are not taking this class for credit, is sometimes they, they've taken a, a bit longer to get things done. And I can understand, I'm, I'm sympathetic to them. Um, I, I have one student who, he's a ninth grader, and it was his first 
semester in high school, and he did fantastic. He sent me his his, his uh, report card just a couple days ago. He has straight A's and his straight A minuses, and he was really proud of that. And he said, I have to apologize. I just didn't have enough time to work on, on this that I need to. And similarly, another student who's just an amazing star, but sometimes is just so overscheduled with, you know, she's in a chorus and she's in a young um, uh, um, uh, symphony uh, conductors workshop, and she, she just doesn't have a lot of time, but she's still trying to do this course as well. So in terms of, of, of being really strict with benchmarks and making sure that they're following things, we'll follow up with the students and try to push them to get things done. Um, but this project has taken a little bit longer. We had actually hoped for it to be done by, uh, uh, by last week, and students are actually just finishing their interviews uh, this week. So it, it takes a little bit of flexibility. That said, um, we're also running a class for the Bay School, and I showed you um, for them. We'll be a little stricter with them and actually probably have uh, uh, graded benchmarks for them to complete things because they're all taking the class for credit and they are being supported by their teacher at their school. So it really depends on, on um, I think, the, the background of the students, knowing that they're ninth graders or older students, whether they're, they are taking the class for credit or not. Um, these are all things that you need to decide for yourself in, in developing your own project uh, uh, projects. Adam, can you describe the population of students that are in the course that is not the Bay School course? How spread out are they? So the majority of, of well, let me say there's first nine students here. Um, the majority of them are ninth graders, so they're from last year's graduating eighth grade class. Um, only one of those ninth graders is taking the class for credit. The rest are just doing it because of their own, own interest, or I have to admit some of them probably because their parents are pushing them to. But we also have two sophomores um, at the Branson School, which is in Marin County, just north of here. They graduated from Case, took AP Chinese last year, and are taking this as the next progression because there's no or nothing else for them to do. And the one student who's in um, uh, in Connecticut right now, she, as I mentioned, she's a junior, and she's taken two years of Chinese. But interestingly, and I don't think she'll be embarrassed that I see this. I'm not identifying her name anyway. Um, she, her Chinese is not as good as the other other students. She's for two years. She's just been in this very very elementary class, and th everything's been too easy for her. So she's kind of forgotten a little bit of things. So even if you hear her interview, um, which you, I wouldn't play, I didn't play the sound for you. She's making a lot of mistakes, and there's she needs a little bit more feedback in terms of things that she has to improve on. So in, in terms of also what we're doing at the advanced level, we have to have a bit of leeway as well, given that some students have different uh, levels of proficiency just simply because they've forgotten something. But, but um, these students are all case graduates. As for the, the base school class, most of them are case graduates, but a couple of them are, um, are heritage speakers who are strong enough to be able to, to be uh, working at the advanced level. In connection with them working at the advanced level, uh, Xu Laoshi has asked how to assess these online students' oral abilities at the advanced level, talking about more abstract topics in discourse. So uh, let me go over here into the syllabus and logistics page. Um, we have just a basic rubric of what we're looking for students to be able to do um, in, in, in terms of their language forms and so on. And um, uh, this is a little bit more in terms of, of, of our rubrics for their online discussion. But then for any kind of things that, that's more, uh, more communicative or presentational, we're trying to base this um, on the actual standards, but giving them, uh, you know, highlighting things that they really need to, to be able to do when they're presenting, so that they need to be well-structured output that they have a, a clear idea of how that they're putting together their presentation has um, ample information. Um, it's, it's clearly and convincingly delivered, and this is, really isn't a problem for most of our students because they've been speaking since speaking Chinese since they were they were younger. They've got very clear pronunciation and tones, but they're also using a, a, a varied range of vocabulary. Remember, in the case it often has to do with connective devices. Chinese being a, a, a language that doesn't have um, morphological change like Western languages often do, they really need to think about how am I structuring sentences and connecting sentences in ways that it sounds like that I'm uh, um, uh, using words that, that do feel more advanced. Um, and so we have 
groups for this. We, for, for some of the activities, we ask them to use some of the vocabulary that they may have been uh, introduced to to, to, to make uh, appropriate transitions and such. Um, so th this is just you know, uh, one example of, of what we've been doing for, for this level of communicative and presentational output. Great. One component of project-based learning in its gold standard form is 21st century skills. Those have to do with uh, working not, a, you know, with learners working not so much as individuals but as part of groups of inquiry, learning how to uh, conduct research with separate division of labor so that each person, person takes responsibility for one piece and then they come back and synthesize and put it into a whole and then also it's connected with the use of technology. Uh, do, how, do the 21st century skills form part of your assessment set uh, and if not are you thinking about including them? Can you address 21st century skills? Sure. I'm actually, Stephen. I'm glad you brought those up. I wanted to share a website. Um, the the 20 uh, um, it's p21.org. It's the Partnership for 21st Century Skills, and I have a printout of it. Went to their website, and everything is down right now. I can't access anything on their web page. But I highly recommend that. Um, part that, that participants download the PDF of the 21st century skills map, which gives a, a really great outline of things that we've done traditionally in the past and things that we, sh we ideally should be doing today in terms of 21st century skills. Now, in terms of what, um, what Stephen, you mentioned in terms of, of, of a larger project where, where, where students are working together, we, we've, again, we haven't done a lot of that yet because of the nature of the online class. And I mentioned very briefly our second um, our second unit on the Chinese entrance exam, and students had to do a skit together with someone else. We actually did find some students, some students that were like, you know, oh, I'll sure help. I, I'm trying to, to be in touch with someone who would adore a video and he won't respond and so on. And so that's the level of difficulty that we're finding with the online environment that we wouldn't have if we were all in the classroom. We can just simply point to them and say, hey, hey, you need to work with your partner on this and, and get, get going. So uh, this is, a, again, another rationale for why we've moved more slowly into doing the project-based learning. Um, this major project-based uh, project learning that we're doing here um, is individual. The next project, I want to try to do something that's, uh, that is more, um, more cooperative. That's in, um, very briefly involving watching the movie E.E., e., where um, it, a lot of the, the, the themes of the movie have to do with how do we communicate what we are thinking. How do we communicate our existence um, and our experiences to other people? And one of the characters uses photography for this and tries to show people things that they cannot see. So we're going to create a project where the students have to, to do their own photography and show things that they cannot see and try to explain things that other people cannot see that they can see and see if they can communicate that in Chinese with each other and have other people respond and see if they can come back and, 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 and share other things. So it's going to be interactive in that sense, even though it's going to be a little bit more driven by what one individual student will bring to the table in terms of, of the, the photograph or photographs they, 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 they show. And then um, moving to the spring, I'm trying to work with an organization um, here in San Francisco where students would be able to do some translation work. Uh, translating documents into Chinese for immigrant uh, communities. Um, this may be something that students would be able to go to their office, but I have to be conscious that I have a student in Connecticut who wouldn't be able to do that very readily. So uh, I'm trying to figure out a way that this could be done primarily online, but then also have an opportunity for students to actually visit their offices if they have um, uh, downtime to do more service learning work. Great. That sounds like a, a wonderful set of projects. With regard to the, the one uh, about photography, I, I like the idea of photography being set up as an alternative mode of communication, but then you step back and look and try to use language to talk about the, the photography. One part of that would be students would need to acquire some skills in criticism, artistic criticism, you know, how do people judge photographs or what, what kinds of things do you analyze or look at in a photograph and to deal with those things in Chinese would be a new experience for me, I know, but it, I think it would be really fun. I, I don't have a lot of time to talk about this unit. I'm showing you the page that we've just started for students to just, get, just dip their, their toes into it next week. 
Um, but the, the, the idea is, is often getting very, very philosophical. And we watch this movie, we also watch um, uh, the Taiwan cartoonist Tai Chi Jones' uh, representations of, of, of Zhuangzi. And I'll skip ahead and it's showing the the, the 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 famous story of Zhuangzi and the butterfly, which I think has a has a has a has a connection to something that happens in the movie. And the idea is for students to 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 actually try to write out what do they understand is happening in these very animatic scenes in the movie, and what the heck does it have to do with Zhuangzi? And so, so we're asking students to go deeper into very very abstract thinking. This is almost getting into superior level tasks. To, to, to really push to, to, to express themselves in more abstract ways and then actually to, to go further and then use this idea of trying to, to, um, to explain something that is, is otherwise unexplainable unless you have a photograph and you're going to explain something that's very personal to them. So that's my approach with it in a nutshell. I, I, could, I could give another long presentation about how I've, I've structured this. It's a really, really fun unit. And it actually, we even, you know, can di dive into ideas of the meaning of life in, the, in this film. And I, I'll just put in a plug. If you don't know this film, E.E. E. came out in the year 2000. Uh, it's a Taiwan movie, and it's one of the most wonderful movies. I recommend going to your, uh, to checking on Netflix and see if you can watch it. It's a long movie, but it's, it's really worthwhile. Great. Thanks for the recommendation. And uh, with that, having given our participants the homework of going and checking out the film EE, e., we will draw today's session to a close and look forward to seeing everyone again tomorrow for our final session, same time, same station. Thank you all very much for your participation.